Yes. Like a little closer. Yours is so good. Yeah. Right. I, I thank you. <laughs> Hello. Okay. I think I think you're just that was that yeah. Yeah. Okay, everybody, we're about to start the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You ready? Yes. Yeah, is it recording? Yeah, that's it. You know. <laughs> okay, good good evening, everybody. This is the uh, citywide neighborhood committee meeting of May 18th. Recording in progress. And uh, we have quite a full agenda of various guests who are going to be presenting us with various topics. But let me start with just mentioning who the members of our committee uh, is, or who, who are the members are. Uh, Kathleen Bodak is over there, and Lori Selloway. And then we have uh, Will Gatchel, who's not here today. Uh, we have um, Elaine uh, Apatang, the co-chair, together with me, Peter Samsich. Uh, Larry Cataldo is on Zoom, I believe. There he is on the Hi. top. Hi, Larry. Okay. All right. Hi, Larry. <laughs> I thought I felt something over my shoulder. <laughs> um, and then John Tabor, our city councilor, is going to join us later on. That's right. So uh, I guess um, we just took attendance inadvertently. Uh, so Will is the one who's not here. That's right. Everybody else is here with Zoom. Larry's on Zoom. So we have, except for Will, everyone's uh, present or on Zoom. Okay. Okay, so we have a couple of presentations today about various things going on in town. And um, uh, Elaine and I have pretty much taken upon ourselves to be promoters of whatever is happening in town. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we, we don't have any other powers that, uh, besides that, <laughs> and we don't have any kind of budget either. <laughs> so, therefore, um, uh, we're, we're more than happy to endorse and, and, and publicize anything going on in town, and we're happy to have various people here today. And maybe you can, uh, Elaine, you can introduce the first group about Thanks, the plaque, plaque yes. committee. Tonight we have Talia Sparduto. Mary Thomas and Margaret Hodges of the Portsmouth Historic Plaque Committee. And they are going to tell us about the program that we have been working on with Portsmouth, for, Portsmouth and H400. And here with us is Valerie Roshan as well. Okay, ladies, you may begin, please. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Talia Sperduto. I am the liaison for the Portsmouth, New Hampshire 400th Community and Neighborhoods Committee. And like Elaine just mentioned, I have been working with four other ladies to get the Portsmouth Historic Plaques um, Committee program going for this year. And if those of you who may not know, um, Portsmouth 400 is a program that is a group of engaged community members who came together in this 400th year of Portsmouth to help with celebrations around our city. So we have events and programs and projects, and one of these is the Portsmouth Historic House Plaques Program. It's a legacy project for our city that we hope to carry on in years to come. And we have Mary Thomas representing the Friends of the South End on our committee, Elaine who is representing the CNC, and Valerie who is our managing director at PNH 400, Valerie Roshan, and then Margaret Hodges who is an Athenaeum member and a genealogist professionally. Wow. So this program is actually a reinvigoration from a program that the um, Portsmouth advocates who are members of the Portsmouth Historical Society. Um, they started this program a number of years ago and it was a historic sign program that was available to people who lived in the south end of Portsmouth <laughs> and they would do research on their homes and then supply this research to the historical society who would check it over and then they gave that information to a historic sign company who made these signs and then supplied them to residents and so a few residents were able through this first program to get signs up on the sides of their homes but this program like I mentioned was just specific to the south end and hard for other residents in the community to 
get engaged with and it sort of fell by the wayside. So our group of four women and various community organizations have spent a lot of time this winter and spring organizing, getting our new sign design passed through the HDC and getting a new application process ready that will be easy for all residents to access online and it will be accessible through our website. So I'm gonna turn over the mic to Mary who's gonna talk more about the details of our sign. Next slide. Thank you. Can you just let me know Thanks, as Tyler. I should, next slide, there you go. Yes, please. There you go. Mm -hmm. yep, it's just one. Thank you very much. Again, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Mary Thomas. I currently serve as the president of the Friends of the South End, otherwise known as FOSSE. Uh, we are a um, 501c3 neighborhood group. Um, uh, and I got involved with the Portsmouth Historic Plaque Committee when a few FOSSE members expressed interest in, as Tali said, reinvigorating a citywide plat program to coincide with other um, of the 400 celebrations that are happening in town this year. Um, and we really view this as an opportunity for residents to highlight this special time in our shared history. Um, and commemorate uh, uh, with a commemorative marker for their house. Uh, therefore, for the remainder of this year, we are offering plaques that do include the phrase, as you can see along the bottom of the slide, history lights our way, and the years 1623 and 2023. The plaques are made out of five quarter inch uh, clear red cedar. They are primed and painted white with black hand lettering and are available in two sizes, as you see. The smaller size measures nine, in, nine by 11 and a quarter inches. The larger one is 11 and a quarter by 16 inches. Um, the shape is inspired by one that was approved by the HDC back in 2018. They are rectangular in shape with an arched top which features a ship design. This design is inspired by Portsmouth's rich shipbuilding legacy and evokes the silhouette of the frigate ship Raleigh. Uh, the Raleigh appears on the New Hampshire state flag, the state seal, as well as the city seal of Portsmouth. The cost of the plaque reflects our commitment to offering a superior product while also trying to keep the price to the resident as low as possible to encourage citywide participation. Uh, red cedar is a very expensive, but it will weather our New England winters and summers much better than other types of wood can. Um, and while some cities and towns in the area are offering cut vinyl lettering on their plaques, we are offering um, the hand-painted enamel lettering with, uh, sealed with a clear top coat. Um, also included in the price is the fee that will be earned by our team of historical fact checkers so that everyone may be assured that the details included, included on each plaque are as accurate as possible. Uh, therefore, Oops, we. That's <laughs> 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 oh, okay. Um, that's the gist of it, really. Um, therefore, we have priced the plaque at two hundred and fifty dollars, with fifty of that being underwritten by a generous PNH four hundred sponsor. So that will be for the first sixty residents who submit an application and receive a plaque. Uh, after this year, 
the plaques will no longer include the 400th information at the bottom, but will retain the line about the Portsmouth Athenaeum. Uh, and I just wanted to say from the very beginning um, of the formation of the plaque committee, um, we have prioritized the historical accuracy of the information uh, and the dates that will be displayed on the plaques. Uh, and the other presenters tonight will speak more to those details in the coming minutes. But uh, I just wanted to thank you all for coming and listening. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Sure. Next slide. So as Mary mentioned, the first 60 plaques will be getting a sponsorship and will be covered partially by Service Credit Union. We're very thankful for their generous donation to help start our program off. And just as like a little background of how you're going to be able to access our application, it's going to be online. We're in the process of getting everything up and running in the next week or so. So you'll be able to go to the PH 400 website and click on our Legacy Projects tab, and our application will be right there for you to access. And you will essentially submit the research that you have done with the help of our program, and Margaret is going to be speaking to this in a moment. Um, but you'll submit the research under our first application tab, and then within two weeks' time, our team will get back to you, and we will confirm the build date and the historic person of interest or first homeowner that you have chosen for your plaque. And then you will resubmit those details to us. And within two weeks' time from that point, we will have your plaque ready for you. And you'll be able to pick it up at the Portsmouth Athenaeum. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say next slide and pass it over to Margaret. Um, one thing I want to just add, um, one thing that we decided is that uh, we, we don't have a time cut off for how old a house has to be to get a historic plaque. Hmm. We feel that anyone who wishes to document their house's history should be able to, because in 50, 100 years, houses built 20 years ago will be historic homes. So anyone who wants to do this is welcome to do so. Awesome. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why historical accuracy is important. And I, I expect I'm preaching to the choir, but I'll just run through this quickly. <laughs> Um, the house plaques are going to become part of Portsmouth's historical record. Um, they will become part of Portsmouth's landscape and will be part of the historic signage that is throughout our city. So it's important that, be, that it be accurate for that. Another reason is that we need to leave a solid foundation for future researchers to build upon. As Talia said, this is a legacy program that we hope will continue on into the future, hopefully indefinitely. So we want to establish a strong foundation so that people who go back and want to look at their house again can find something accurate to move forward from. And when it comes right down to it, accuracy is a standard of good historical research. Um, and we are following the lead of the Portsmouth Advocates who founded this program initially and who established um, uh, standards for research, uh, and we, we are adhering to those. So, um, and Talia talked about the fact checking. Unfortunately, doing accurate historical research can be extremely daunting, especially for people who are not familiar with this kind of work. Good historical research requires finding old documents that are often very difficult to access and sometimes difficult to understand. It requires in looking in lots of places to find information about your house. And you may be disappointed. You may think, oh, well, if I go and look in at this, I'll find what I need. And it may be that it's just not even there. And maybe most daunting and terrifying of all, Doing good historical research requires you putting your findings all together in writing. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we want to 
so we want to adhere to those standards, but at the same time, we want people researching their homes to be successful and have a good time. So one of our goals and one of our commitments is that we want to connect our researchers to resources and support to make this process as easy and enjoyable and successful as possible. And there are a couple of things we're going to do to accomplish that. The first one is there's going to be a help sheet available on the, on the website to get researchers started so they can kind of understand what is expected of them, what their options are, and how to make the first steps in pursuing each what we call record set, each group of documents where they may find some information about their house. So help sheet. And then I think probably the most important thing is that we are partnering with local repositories because many of the records that are needed for house research are all in one place or all in or many of the groups are in one place or another place so that if you go to these pl to these places you can get a lot of your work done and the even better thing is is that at these local repositories there uh, there is knowledgeable and very helpful staff who are that is their job, to greet researchers, to find out what they need, and to help them find it. So those uh, repositories and organizations, just the major ones, the Portsmouth Athenaeum, which is the go-to place for house history research, the Portsmouth Public Library, which also has a lot of these records uh, that are needed, um, and also the Rockingham County Registry of Deeds. They are very, very helpful. And you can either phone them or you can go in and someone will help you at the computer there. Uh, sometimes their, um, their search system, uh, you need a little coaching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then finally, um, if, if, it, if you just don't have time to do it or it's just too daunting, you can hire a researcher. You can hire a professional to do that. And that, that would be a separate process. Um, and. Uh, that person could be hired to do the entire project for someone or just one aspect of the project that someone is particularly uncomfortable with, like deed research or something like that. So those are all available to hopefully help people be successful and have fun doing this. We do not want to be gatekeepers. We want everyone who wishes to have a plaque to receive a plaque and to be accurate in their information. So. Um, one of the first things we're going to do to kind of incorporate all this stuff is we're going to have an event for researchers at the Portsmouth Athenaeum. Um, so it's going to be an event where we help everyone get started with house research. Um, we don't have a date or a time yet for it, but the Athenaeum Library will be there and she will introduce researchers to the house history resources that are available at the Athenaeum. So everyone will get a look at them, everyone will get an idea of where they are, <coughs> and they will get comfortable and will meet the librarian and get comfortable with the space. So that, that's a great start right there. And then after an introductory, um, the researchers will have a chance, a, a period of time, where they can begin their research with help from um, knowledgeable staff and volunteers who will um, you know, help them look at material and um, kind of coach them on how, how, to, um, how to find their way through some of these records. So we are really, really looking forward to helping the community to discover the history of their homes and contribute to the city's historical record. Thank you so much. Thank you, Margaret, Talia, and Mary. That was a great presentation. Does anyone here have any questions about the plaque program? One question, is there a different price for the size? Can you speak into the, speak into the, the mic? Is there any difference in the prices for the large and the small plaques? There are, yes. Do you have the numbers on that now? No. So I think <laughs> the small plaques are 250 and the larger plaques are 275 okay. unless you're part of the early group, and then they're $50 off those prices. Okay. And, and while I have the microphone, if I may, I just have to say that these four rock stars, you need to understand what they've been going through to put this together. Mm -hmm. So Mary is actually hand painting these. <laughs> She's hand painting these. So when you talk about <laughs> something that's that's hand painted by Mary, wow. um, and she and her husband that's will beautiful. be making most of those plaques, although 
I think we volunteered to come and paint some, right? Um, <laughs> paint uh, <either>. So, <laughs> so I or mean, the, th the work that she's doing with Fosse and her historic subcommittee at Fosse is amazing. And Talia, <laughs> thankfully, has a whole lot of energy <laughs> and, and has really pulled this together for us. And I'm really thankful yes, that she she's has. a representative of, the, of uh, Portsmouth NH400. And we were so lucky to find Margaret. Yes. Um, <laughs> because we nearly need to have all of this research accredited. You know, you can do all this research, but if you don't have somebody who knows what they're talking about mm. accredited, you can't put that plaque up on your up on your building. So, so lucky to find Margaret when the Portsmouth advocates um, were, not, were not willing to, were not able to go forward. And then you have this one who's like a two-year-old. She's got so much energy <laughs> and, <laughs> and pulling it all together. And Elaine, you've just, I mean, I just think you, know, you need to acknowledge that you have four rock stars here that are going to work for you. So um, they're really interested in having each of the neighborhoods get involved Absolutely. Um, so that there are these plaques everywhere. Like go to Marblehead. Go to Marblehead. All you see is these plaques, and they are so interesting. We need them here. So they're going to make it happen. I'm proud yes, of you guys. I think it's very exciting, as you mentioned, Margaret, that this is open to all of the residents throughout Portsmouth who are interested in researching their homes. Okay, so thank mm -hmm. you so much. Oh, let's see. If can I just mention one more thing? Just another plug sure. for the whole thing. Um, <laughs> you know, d describing a, this kind of loses sight of the fact that this kind of research is actually really exciting. And when people discover the people who lived in their houses yeah. centuries ago, and the year that their home was built, and they get some idea of what the neighborhood was like during that period of time, I think that it really helps people feel uh, a closer connection to the community and to the history of the city. And I think that makes us all better citizens. Absolutely. That's great. OK. Kathleen has another question. Of information. In, re in researching my house, I, there was built in 1780. I've gotten oh. to 1813 so far, but I know 1780. We found out that one, at one point, the house was sold for a total of $300. Wow. <laughs> the owners were able to pay for it over two years. So they paid $150 wow. one year and $150 <laughs> wow. the next wow. year. That's cool. fascinating. Wow. Yeah. So it's fun. You find all interesting things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see if anybody online has any questions. Okay. Larry, do you have a question? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Oh, Fred has a question. Yeah. So maybe it will be on the website, maybe not, but is there some ex either example or some parameter by which you could ex help people understand the magnitude of what they're signing up for? Like how much research is research? It's a subjective term, and I think if people understood what they were signing up for, it would help them kind of evaluate whether it's something they could take on with the kids and the school and the work and everything else or so. I think that that is that is going to be reasonably clear on the website. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Um, I think maybe that's something we'll need to talk about and see if there's anything else we need to, you know, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Or an example of some kind of work. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. Thank but, you. I mean, if you want an answer to that question now, it's kind of it's variable, especially depending on the age of your home. Of so Very true. if your home was built in 1970 it's probably quite easy to go on to the Registry of Deeds and track exactly who owned your home and when it was yeah. built. You could probably find the builder. Um, yeah. If it was 1780, <laughs> like your house, it may take you days of mm. commu cumulative research. Yeah. And so if you are a person that has kids and dogs and <laughs> lots of things going on, you may need to come to us and ask about the option for hiring someone to do the research mm. or mm. working with us in a different way to help yeah. you figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Peter? Yeah, so I think I have a, a couple questions maybe for Margaret. Number one, um, I assume that that label on the plaques th that has the Athenaeum on it, that that lends some certification to the fact that this was researched and certified by you guys as being factual as much as possible. I, I, came that, late, I came late to the process. So by the time I came to the process, that had been decided. So maybe you can speak to that better than I can. Yeah, we chose to have the Athenaeum as our label of certification 
um, for a few reasons. One, because all of us were brought to the table originally in the Athenaeum, yes. and we found it to be the center of research and knowledge for our whole process. We were reflecting back on what the advocates first set up as research criteria, and they did a lot of their work from there. And also, Margaret being a member of the Athenaeum and many of us being members there, um, we thought it seemed like it was a good certification to have on the plaque, especially because 20 years from now, 30 years from now, we will have each person's plaque records and research on file at the Athenaeum. Mm -hmm. So when someone looks at this sign, say in 30 years, and says, oh, I wonder where this comes from, if they look up the Portsmouth Athenaeum online, then they can get access to all of this information. So. Yeah, I, I, I my, my question really was, does that, because that's on the sign, does that convey the message that it's been looked at by the Athenaeum? Yes. Okay, yeah. that's, that's all I was asking. And number two, um, you, you said there's no age of a house that is excluded from this process, but I assume we're trying to look at some, some kind of history, and the fact that I lived in this house, it doesn't make it historical. <laughs> so so is, are there no other criteria except that I want a plaque like that on my house? That's it. That's it. I just like the plaque, so. When we're celebrating the 450th, it will be historical. That's yeah, right. I know. At some point, it will be. <laughs> uh, okay, so so everybody can do this. Uh, it's a matter of of looking into the history of your own house, and having it researched by someone knowledgeable like yourself, um, and have so that the plaque is kind of certified that way. Yes. Okay, and let's see. Do I have um, no? I think that's the only questions I had. So thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Well, if are there any other questions from the audience? Okay. Okay, well, thank you so much, ladies, for coming in and for doing this presentation. Um, Valerie, thank you for being here as well. And um, we will share information as we receive them from the committee. We'll share it on, on our city web page and, of course, on the Portsmouth 400 page. It's and also via Facebook. email. Pardon? It's already up on Facebook. Okay, so they put it up on Facebook. <laughs> great, great. Make sure everybody shares it, okay? All right, thank you again for your time. We really thank appreciate much. it. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. And thank, thank you for the wonderful. Yeah. Great job, Mary, with the mock-ups. That was a great presentation. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Next we have Here's the plaque. Jim Splane. <laughs> Hi, Jim. How are hey. you? Thank you. <laughs> yes, it's in there. back there. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, okay. So, wonderful project. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Can I put it in? Yeah, sure. please do. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Hi, Peggy. A wonderful perspective, too, when you think about it. All of us live in potentially historic homes. Yes. Well, maybe not me. It's sort of a mobile home, but. Oh, it could be historic, too. You never know. In 100 years, you, never know. you know, that's going to go quickly. 21, 23. Uh, Take your time. Fortunately, <laughs> we won't be around to see it, so. <laughs> well, you know, we, we might be down or up, or up but depending on one's true. perspective. <laughs> um, look, uh, two things I'll open with that, that I'd uh, like to mention. One is that um, the sun sets tonight at two minutes past eight. So I'm going to be brief so that <laughs> most of us can get to see it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, John, <coughs> so good to see you. The last time I was in this room was about 15, uh, 17 months ago mm -hmm. when we had a non-public session in the previous city council, and it wasn't exactly the most pleasant uh, mm -hmm. experience. So, and I'm glad to see you changed uh, some of the furniture around. I mean, so, so much of this is, is new and different. Nice job. It could use a little more touching up, couldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it, it? It needed to. It's more at home. Let's hope that doesn't encourage more non-public sessions, but it's more homey. Um, I'd, I'd like to just talk about two things tonight. Uh, you, did everybody receive the memos that I had sent out? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I sent it um, out. And, and, and there'll be a tomorrow on this. So, you know, I'm, I'm, all I'm here for is to, like, throw the snowball, you know, get yes. the thought out for both neighborhood walks for your, your neighborhood committee, um, and I'll review a little bit about the past on that, and the concept of time capsules, which, which I think is just a great <laughs> 
way of doing what we just heard. Uh, in fact, I can envision um, you know, time caps of dif different homes. I mean, you don't have to go around and have neighborhood time capsule or a citywide time capsule, although we're going to have that. I'm working on the 21-23 time capsule that will be, will be buried on New Year's Eve of this year. But, um, you know, any home, you can have a time capsule, you know, put it in the basement and, and maybe in 50 years or whatever, somebody will see that. So um, first about the neighborhood walk. Um, as, as you may know, I was um, one of the three initial um, uh, uh, organizers of the, of the neighborhood committee back in the mid-1990s. Uh, mid uh, Eileen Foley appointed, uh, Mayor Eileen Foley appointed three of us. I was assistant mayor at the time. Evelyn Sorrell, who eventually became mayor of the city, wonderful woman, was on along with Jenny Weeks. And we, uh, as part of our effort to try to organize the idea, uh, we had three neighborhood walks in the 19, 1990s. One was in my neighborhood, which was the Willard Avenue area. Another was in Evelyn Sorrell's neighborhood, which is um, uh, John Hines' area as well. And uh, one was on Dennett Street, and that was kind of capped by what you might think of doing. That was a forum. We had a forum. Uh, hey, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I only saw you from the back. Um, uh, we uh, had a, a uh, an exciting forum about the North Mill Pond and what the North Mill Pond could become mm. uh, if we avoid hotels and all the other big things around the North Mill Pond uh, for the year 2020. And it was an exciting uh, forum with about 30 people. We did that at the New Franklin School. And uh, we had walked around trying to interest people in going to it. And it turned out really well. So the idea of the neighborhood walk um, that we had then, and I might suggest that you would benefit from, is, uh, and it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, you know, all these things that I'm suggesting tonight, these two things, that, that you can keep them simple, kiss it, keep it, keep it simple and simpler. Uh, the neighborhood walk, you can get, it's just like a political campaign. You knock on doors mm -hmm. as a committee. Maybe uh, half of the committee can, can participate, maybe the entire committee, uh, knock on doors all together, or split it up in a neighborhood and say, uh, you know, what's happening in your neighborhood that you might be interested in? Instead of expecting them to come to you, you are going to them. Yes. which isn't a bad idea. And I've watched some of your meetings, and I've seen some participants at the meetings from different neighborhoods. And I, I was on five different neighborhood uh, committees through my years. I was city council representative on some in the 1990s. I was on a couple as a member. And, um, you know, you can certainly hear of a lot of ideas, but the best I, way I think to get ideas is to kind of go out and knock on doors and, and what's wrong with your neighborhood? What are you concerned about? And I used to hear a lot about potholes. Mm -hmm. I used to hear about speeding, dogs yes. barking, a lot of dogs barking, and other kind of neighborhood noises. So I, anyway, I think you can do that. It, okay. uh, it, it, it um, can be a natural outgrowth of your ward forums. Whenever you have a ward forum, think of doing that an hour before the meeting. Get people there. Or at least when you go to the media, you can say, hey, saw you, knocked on your door a few minutes ago, or we heard these kind of problems are in this neighborhood. You might even find somebody who would like to uh, have a coffee or a tea um, and uh, invite people to their home on an off night. Um, you know, two people participating in a neighborhood is a lot of people. You get 20, and that's a bonus. So anyway, give it a, give it a little thought. Um, and relax. I mean, don't make a big thing out of it. I think if you did this three, four times a year, you'd have a lot of progress. I urge you to think more about it in the next um, uh, couple of months, and you might think doing something after your next forum. I assume you're not doing forums in the summertime, but next time you have a forum in the fall, you might consider doing it. Can I go on to the next, uh, next yes, one? Yes, you may. Um, let me see if anybody has any questions, anybody in the committee especially. I just don't want to hold you up for so long. I have a question. Larry has a question. Uh, actually, first, I have a statement. Um, I went on three walks with Jim, and I was really surprised at the number of issues that came about. Now, Jim was a city councilor at the time and running for re-election, and I can appreciate that. But um, that, that te uh, a lot of the city councils will be doing just that in the next uh, number of months uh, of uh, ones who are candidates. 
And um, that's one thing. But it's another thing when we represent the neighborhoods themselves. And a small group of people, including a representative from the neighborhood, will kind of escort us around to the, uh, to the various streets. It's not a big deal. It's a very simple deal. But several things have come out of this. One of them being um, um, uh, over on Dennis Street, um, a traffic, um, not on Dennis, but uh, um, I think it's, um, um, I can't think of the street off here. Thornton, Thornton and Bartlett. Thornton. Yeah. Yeah, Thornton and Bartlett. They, the neighbors complained about the crosswalk and uh, how dangerous it really was. There was a stop sign there, it was, a, it was an intersection and they reported it to the police numerous times. And we heard it right, uh, right from the beginning. Someone came out, we knocked on the door, someone came out and explained the situation very clearly. Of course, it was just recently, and I mean like this year, mm -hmm. that they put a circle uh, instead of a, a stop sign or lights, they put a circle in and slowed all the traffic down. But we, can, we uh, as citywide neighborhood committee people, have more latitude than the city councilors do because we can we can first go to um, Peter Bryce and, and the others on public works and start the ball rolling there. We can uh, and we can um, put a CUP a CIP up there. We can um, take the action in front of the city council if necessary. Um, so we have a lot more latitude than sometimes the councilors themselves. I do recommend that we at least do one or two walks in the fall. We need most of, if not all of the committee people to participate. Because having a little crowd there, we get the neighborhood representative, whoever, whoever that person is, um, and then uh, we, we advertise it in, um, uh, through the, uh, in the press if necessary. And uh, we just go out and do it. It is a lot of fun. And you, you definitely hear a lot of things from the neighbors. Okay. And you learn a lot too. How many of you know what a rolling stop is? <laughs> no. Well, I'll tell you. And okay, it's a little embarrassing. Um, I was I was city councilor off and on since 1970, um, through the 90s, 2000. I was assistant mayor six times. I was a state representative, state senator. A total of 30 years, until I went on this visit to Bartlett Street uh, with Larry and a few other people, um, Bartlett and, and, and um, um, Thornton. Uh, Thornton, I had no idea what a rolling stop was. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't part of my, you know, my radar, at least my ear radar. <laughs> um, but we had the, uh, new, he's Mark Newport, who's now the police chief with us at another time, and, and he told me what a rolling stop is, is when you go up to some place and you keep on going. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't give you a chance when you're doing that to check no pedestrians, no bicyclists, and accidents occur. And that's, that's the idea of the, the roundabout. I mean, great idea, I think. I, I think it's gonna work well. And if they build it a little higher for the winter, because otherwise snow is gonna cover it and people are gonna go right over it with no well, stop Larry's, signs there. Larry's from New Jersey, so he well knows what that stop looks like. Well, he never told me until we went out there. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll also embarrass myself by saying I did a heck of a lot of rolling stops through my life, yeah. but now I always catch myself because the police chief made it very clear the danger involved. I mean, and plus it is a violation. Yeah. I mean, it is a violation. So anyway, I think Larry summarized it really well. Yeah. Shall we go into the other thing? I mean, 802 yes. is coming kind yeah. of close. Well, thank you very much. Um, I love the idea personally and the mm -hmm. committee. We will speak with the committee members about it and we'll be happy to do it. It only oh, takes a spark plug to make it work. I, I a resident has a question. I have absolutely no idea who our neighborhood committee representative are. Mm -hmm. And I think... Okay. And I've looked on the city website, and I think I've met them at the block party. But, you know, there's no, um, ringing the doorbell would be great, but it would also be nice if people had any idea who these people are. <laughs> just, just saying. You know, I know, I, and I bet oh. they live down the street from me. You know, but I don't know that, that their, you know, their identities are hidden. I'll mm. make sure you find out. Uh, yes. We're in Ward 3. And I can't speak. I can't speak for the committee. 
used to be able to, but I can't speak for the committee now. But if you want to volunteer to be on this committee, I think you could. <laughs> and they need people like you on the committee. I can also tell in your 30-second comment that you're really dedicated for your neighborhood. So think about it. I mean, the city council appoints. Uh, Daglin McCacker, our current mayor, would I'm sure be glad to talk with you. And you can see him on the website and talk with Elaine, talk with Steve, talk, talk with Larry, Peter. I mean, that's what you, we need, people from different neighborhoods. Go Ward 3. I, yeah. I think, <laughs> I, I think uh, it's, it's uh, good to know that there are no official neighborhood representatives. They're not elected. They're not, they're all volunteers. And Elaine's been yeah. doing a great job trying to beat the bushes in the neighborhoods to find out somebody who would like to be that representative uh, and be uh, connected to us. But it's not like an elected office or anything like that. That's why nobody really knows who the neighborhood representative is. And because you spoke up, you might be one. <laughs> Elaine, you have two more in the bush. <laughs> Elaine, you have two more in the bush over there. <laughs> but to your point, I think it, it would be possible like Elaine knows who some of these folks are and people in those neighborhoods don't know who some of those people are. Right. So there's got to be a way to publish that. Yeah. So you can go onto the CNC website and see who those volunteers mm -hmm. might be mm -hmm. if you want to, you know, yeah. it, that could only increase engagement. Yeah. I'll yeah. have to get permission, of course, from them. Yeah. 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 Right. Most people that. know who they are, but yeah. you're right. Some people just don't know who the, who the reps are, yeah. but I can, I can speak with that with you about that more later. Thank you. Sure. Well, I think we, we are kind of cautious about the fact that just because somebody volunteers right. to be, <laughs> you don't want to send the whole neighborhood there when there's a problem. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not their problem, and unless they want to uh, take on other kind of duties, uh, they're just willing to be kind of a a, a point of connection, mm -hmm. and that's great. But we we got to be careful about people's Peter, willingness Peter's to right. take on that, I think in a way that the, it, their re email is not revealed mm. you know there are ways right. to set up a website mm -hmm. where you can yep. uh, file a request or yep. whatever, the, yeah. whatever it is mm -hmm. yeah I, I understand what you're saying yeah. yeah okay okay Jim you may move on to the time capsule well the um, one of the most exciting <laughs> things that I I've been involved in um, in, in recent years is planning the 100-year uh, time cap, so 21-23. And it's coming along well, and it's going to be involving, I think, a lot of people. Anybody here who would like to get involved or anybody listening, we still need, need more involvement, but we'll be doing a lot in the next two, three months at, at pulling things together. I love the concept of time capsules because time capsules can be both a fun event and a very productive one. It gets people to, to vision, to think. Um, it gets uh, whomever is participating an opportunity to realize that, hey, 100 years is gonna be coming here unless it's a big tidal wave or unless uh, the climate change really uh, makes the oceans way too tall, Portsmouth is gonna be here well in 100 years. Um, and coming up with possibilities for the city, thinking about the future, not only do you think about 100 years from now, but you think 20 years from now, you th think 10 years ahead from now. And if you come up with a 100-year vision, and that's why I think the uh, time capsule is going to, dis you know, the undiscovered Portsmouth, as I like to talk about it, uh, sometimes that 100-year vision can be done more like 10 and 15 years. So you start thinking, well, you know, let's not delay, let's do some of these things now. Um, I lost a time capsule, as some of you may know. Uh, there's, uh, there's been a couple of newspaper stories, Bob Lister and Ray Will and I, who buried it at the high school in 1995. Uh, we were going to uncover it in 2020, 25-year time capsule. We had photographs that was in the newspapers. We had a lot of students putting things, in, oh, but the poor students who can't find this stuff yet. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Bob Lister wrote a letter to his, his sons, um, and it, it's, it's underground someplace. We've got to find it, and we will. Bob's been uh, digging. Um, <laughs> we had an underground radar. Um, Have you uh, learned anything about that yes. effort to make, make sure, sure that doesn't you, happen again? Well, see, the high school, the problem with the high school was since we buried it in 1995, they rebuilt the high school <laughs> over it. So all the photographs we had taken, like, uh, it's not there, it's over there. So, and they rebuilt the road. Yeah. So, but we have a general idea where, it's gonna, where, okay. it, where it is. We're going to find it. That's one of our commitments. as so we're, turn up. 
I hope. But um, <laughs> anyway, we did have a good time at doing it. Mm -hmm. And we spent about four years. We had a number of forums. We encouraged people mm -hmm. to let, let's bury something for the 2020 Vision Project. It was a project that I was okay. involved in at the time. And we got a lot of students involved, some businesses, uh, city, city people. Uh, Eileen Foley participated in one of the forums mm -hmm. we had. She said in 1991, she said, in the year 2020, people are going to be carrying computers in their pockets. Wow. I mean, she said that. Wow. Um, and she also said that in the year 2020, we're going to have a fireside chat with a woman president. It hasn't quite happened yet, but, you know, Soon. it will. And we've got a woman vice president. And anyway. I encourage you, and this is a snowball that I'm throwing, and oh, you know, there's some information out there, that you consider encouraging any and all neighborhoods in the city. I mean, I can imagine 50 of these, maybe 100, maybe more, because there's a lot of neighborhoods. I'm talking not just about mm -hmm. Maple Haven, but streets on Maple Haven, friends, families on Maple Haven. Encourage them to do time capsules. Generational time capsules are not the 100 year time capsules that we're doing for the city because most of us probably will not be here. Mm -hmm. Probably. Um, although the, the people who are going to be burying the time capsule uh, on New Year's Eve of this year, we're going to have people who are under 10 so that you know, there's more of a chance that they're going to be around <laughs> in, <laughs> in, in good chance. But uh, generational time capsules are more like 25 years. 50 okay. years, perhaps, to the year 2073. Uh, and um, the neighborhoods can come together. A neighborhood can come together, mm -hmm. encourage kids to get involved. They can design the time. Time capsules are not, don't have to be rocket science. The kids will You can actually it. buy them, but kids can, you can buy them on the internet, but uh, kids can make their own time capsule. You know, they, they, a time capsule can be nothing more than a, a wooden or a plastic uh, rubber box okay. uh, in which you put things in glass jars to protect them. It doesn't have to be buried either. It can be in somebody's basement. But the idea is to participate, to collect things, to get people together, to write letters to their future. Uh, parents can write letters to their kids. Um, kids can write letters to their kids. Um, you can have all sorts of different activities, and some of them are written down here, but okay. whatever you invent to encourage people to do it, I think can be dynamite, and you can actually can, can challenge neighborhoods to, to compete with neighborhoods. You can invite businesses in the area to get involved. You can include menus uh, that businesses uh, may have. Uh, you can describe your neighborhood, what you'd like to see your neighborhood look like in 50 years. Mm -hmm. I bet most of them will say, I don't want a five-story hotel in my backyard. Yeah. You know, the those kinds of things give us vision, mm -hmm. and that kind of vision becomes something as people are walking around and they say, hey, there's a time capsule buried at, in that park, or there's a time capsule buried on that front lawn. They start thinking, you know, I wonder what's in it, and you've got to make sure that nobody digs it up early. You've got to mm -hmm. make sure that people know exactly where you put it, but I think it can be a lot of fun. So I, I urge you to think of doing that, and the memo I gave you goes into a page and a half of ideas, but I think you can come up with your own. Absolutely. It only takes one stock park plug on this committee to make it work. Thank you, Jim. I love that idea you, as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a time capsule myself. <laughs> You know, when I heard this project, I mean, um, this is a grand idea, not only the plots, mm -hmm. but a time capsule. Yes. Maybe buried in their cellar or basement. Okay. Maybe not. Maybe put on a wall. How many time capsules do we hear about being discovered in somebody's wall? Yep. I mean, things like that can really be exciting. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Jim about the time capsule? Enjoy the rest of your meeting. Eh? Oh, we will, Jim. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you for coming in person. I don't know if really anyone has it. seen the film mm -hmm. Blast from the Past. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> where, one of my favorite. Oh, 1960s, where this family, uh, with the engineer, of uh, the husband of the family, so. builds himself a nuclear blast uh, bunker in the backyard that's automatically sealed when there's a nuclear war coming and his whole family goes in there and it's sealed for like, what, 25 years or something like that? Okay. And you can't open it until 25 years. It's on a timer, right? So uh, after 25 years, they venture out with suits and because they don't know what's going on and yeah. 
Turns out there's a bar built right on top of the, uh, <laughs> of the bunker, and, 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 and it happens to be the era of, of the hippies, and everyone's mm -hmm. all crazy, you're looking <laughs> with hair and everything, and they come out with these space suits, <laughs> thinking it's radioactive, <laughs> and they're thinking, oh my gosh, these creatures have mutated, look how people look. <laughs> But that's kind of a that time one. capsule in some it ways. <laughs> Peter hasn't described the ending, which is, don't tell him, no. the ending is really super great. Yeah. Um, but uh, I've got the DVD, I'll loan it to anybody. I've okay, seen it I'll probably it. three, four it, times. It's a fun movie. It is a fun movie and yeah. uh, historically accurate because yeah, it, yeah, uh, yeah. the blast occurs uh, when the Cuban crisis is occurring. Cuban Missile Crisis uh, is going they, on, they, yes. Let's get out of here because they hear it on the radio oh, and the plane yeah. happens to, anyway. Yeah. It's a great movie. Yeah. Well, Thank you uh, again, Joan. Five dollars, I'll tell you the ending. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> nice I thought you can't be bought, Jim. <laughs> That's when I was on the council. <laughs> Thank you. My price is cheaper now. <laughs> Peter, will you announce um, Mr. John? John, sure. Uh, so, okay, so we're, we're going to move ahead in our agenda here. Um, uh, our next guest is, is Councillor John Tabor, who is going to give us a, a briefing on the community power program that we're all so excited about here in Portsmouth. Um, I had an opportunity to be on the radio station this morning with Allison Tanner uh, promoting it. And uh, John, you could give this committee a, a view of what's going on. I'll tell everybody about community power. Yep. And uh, Peter's been part of our energy committee from the very start and uh, knows all about it as well and has worked hard with us. Um, community power in its simplest form is means aggregating a town's electric demand and going into the electricity markets and getting better rates and more renewable options. And uh, <clears throat> it was created by a state law um, about seven years ago and we on the Portsmouth Energy Advisory Committee started exploring it. Is it in the best interest of the city to do this? Is it going to save people money? Uh, what are the risks? Um, what are the, um, the things we don't know? So we looked at, uh, we found that community power is very well proven around the country. Uh, it's worked really well in Ohio, Massachusetts, California. Um, and again, it's, it's aggregating your community's electric demand so that you can get the best rates and, and best options. Um, how it works, uh, Portsmouth Community Power purchase the ele purchases the electricity. Um, Eversource, the utility, still does all the poles and wires and gives you the bill. But on your bill, there's two parts. There's the transmission and distribution, which is Eversource, and then there's supply. And supply would become C Portsmouth Community Power. And uh, <clears throat> we're partnering with a cooperative of 30 towns and cities around the state called the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire. And they do all our buying for us. They're, they're like a big um, co-op. They're nonprofit. They're run by governments for governments. They have no purpose other than public benefit. And let's go to the next slide. Where are we now? Well, uh, we uh, got approval from the city council to move ahead with community power. Uh, we looked at some cities and towns just use a broker, a for-profit broker. to broker all their residential load. Um, we didn't think that it had as many long-term advantages, particularly because the coalition will use our money to build a reserve for future solar energy projects, future hydro projects, and that we can take that back to our community and invest in. We could have solar panels on the Coakley landfill. We could have solar panels on the uh, old incinerator uh, site on Jones Avenue, things like that, which in turn would make our electricity even cheaper. Um, after the council approved our plan to move ahead with uh, community power, uh, the coalition um, 
we did all the necessary steps with the Public Utility Commission, and the letters have gone out. You may have gotten them, um, and announcing that uh, community power will start in June. So how's it work? Um, if you are buying from Eversource now, what's called the Eversource default rate, um, <clears throat> the, you, you will become a Portsmouth Community Power customer. We will become the new default supplier. Um, and you'll see the, the benefits of that on the next slide. Um, you'll save uh, the, the current Eversource rate, if you're a default customer, is 20 cents and change. We'll get you a rate of 15.8 cents. But if you wanted to lower the city's carbon footprint and help us become more uh, sustainable as a city, you could buy 33% renewable energy, 50% renewable energy, or 100% renewable energy. All of those are cheaper than what you're paying now for Eversource. So that's why we're really excited about this. We're using the bulk buying power, uh, and <clears throat> we're enabling people to help us uh, have cleaner, more sustainable energy, if that's the option you choose. But it's all voluntary. Um, if you think, uh, I don't want to be in the first wave of this, it sounds risky or uh, I don't understand it, you can choose to stay with the utility. Uh, it will cost you more money, um, but you can go to the Community Power Coalition website or just Google Portsmouth Community Power and you'll get the page where you can opt out, as we say, and go stay with Eversource. Um, if you have a third-party energy supply now, lots of people like direct energy. They seem to be very competitive on their rates. Um, you will wait until that contract is done, and then you have the choice to opt in. Go to the website and, and opt in to community power. <coughs> so. Um, I'll just wait for the slide. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Fred. Thank you, ben. Thanks, John. Uh, this is a complicated slide for small businesses. Small businesses have uh, monthly rates, and our monthly rates would be lower than Eversource's as well on that program. What's the next one? Um, we estimate that just in June and July, we'll save Portsmouth residences and businesses $810,000. And we'll also start building a reserve uh, and that reserve does three things. It helps build um, money for future energy projects. It helps stabilize rates. So for example, this winter when the Ukraine war made energy prices spike up, we would have reserves that we could use to offset that to keep your rate uh, more stable. And third, as the coalition builds <coughs> a great deal of reserves, they get uh, good ratings from the credit agencies, and with a strong reserve, they can actually become a, uh, a large-scale energy buyer in the ISO New England. So all that's beneficial. Um, these are local. You, we have a voice in the uh, Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire. Kevin Charette, who's on our Energy Committee, uh, a really uh, capable guy who worked at Eversource for many years. Uh, he's our representative on the board of the coalition, and he's also the vice chair. Um, and he's proved to be a person of great ability. Peter Rice is our alternate. So we have a voice in all of the coalition decisions. Um, Right now, there's 119,000 customers in the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire, um, or 150 million of billings. Uh, and we estimate there's another number, quite a few towns like Concord um, that are waiting for next year. Dover just decided to wait till next year. But uh, next year, 
we should be over 200,000 customers and we'll be the second largest utility in the state. <coughs> Great buying power. More buying power than Unitil, more buying power than um, uh, the other utility. Liberty uh, Utilities. Liberty, yeah, that's, thank you, Peter. Um, and, uh, and I think the coalition will continue to grow after that as well. So that's exciting because not only do we get the benefits of economies of scale and, and buying power, but we also get a voice in Concord. Um, and New Hampshire is um, behind Maine, behind Massachusetts in the amount of renewable usage. Uh, we have old-fashioned limits on the amount of uh, solar power people can generate and put back into the grid. Um, so a voice in Concord could really help us as communities move towards what's best for our energy future. And um, so I think that's a big benefit as well. So just to wrap it up, um, as of now, but, uh, starting in the June billing period, uh, Eversource default customers will become Portsmouth Community Power customers unless you want to opt out. Uh, and Eversource still delivers your electricity, does the poles and wires, does the billing. Um, and if you have a third party supplier, um, stay with them until your contract's up and then you can opt in. Uh, and lastly and very important, no city taxes are required, no city funds are required. This is funded entirely by the rates of the customers. Um, there really is that much gap in the price efficiency between uh, how the utilities buy their power and how we will buy our power with uh, the cooperative. So uh, people talk about, you know, my friend Charlie Griffin, who um, always says, there's what government does for you and what government does to you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots, th people like to talk about what government does to you. But government can do things for you. Uh, when uh, volunteers, I mean, from around the state, in all, uh, selectmen and the assistant mayor of, of Lebanon, Cliff Below, who spearheaded this, the town manager in, um, in Hanover, uh, when we all work together, um, government can do things that you could never do yourself. So I think it's a good thing. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, John. Yeah. John, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, it's just about um, the broker, not using a broker, or yes, but using a broker. Just what, how did that work, whether you chose one or not chose one, and why? We had the folks come in from Keene, and they use a broker named Standard Power. Uh -huh. And Standard Power says, okay, Keene, you have... 12,000 households will bundle up all of your demand and go into the energy markets. Um, and that's a, that's a way to go. That's the way most of the Massachusetts towns go. Um, but we, found, we felt that there's more strength in a cooperative that gathers a lot of towns, 30 towns and mm -hmm. cities. And the broker will not have the reserve program for future energy projects. We felt that was a real benefit. Um, and Peter, if I missed any of the other? No, no, uh, Standard Power is a really good broker. I mean, they're good people, okay. mm -hmm. and they know what they're doing. But they are just one, one company, mm -hmm. and uh, we felt that the coalition gives us a lot more confidence and security when we're together with 30 other communities yeah. and we're buying as 30 communities and not just as one broker mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, from having served at the legislature uh, one of the concerns that one might have by these in these things is that the legislature might revoke the DNA uh, the uh, uh, permission for cities to do this <laughs> and as soon as we get a big coalition a lot of towns you can't go back anymore you know so that's another good reason to stick with a number of other partners and make sure that what we go to, what we do and move forward with is not going to be 
pulled back on us when we're, we're just about ready to go. So uh, those are those were our, our thinking at the time why we thought a broker is not as good as the coalition. And we also looked at, for example, there's something called the Cape Cod Compact, mm. which is very similar to the Community Power Coalition. In Northern California, yeah. there's a, a cooperative mm -hmm. of a lot of the Northern California, smaller towns. Well, north on Monterey, of, I think, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we saw where we'll be 10 years down the road. And you go to their website, and they've got wonderful offerings. Um, you know, would you like a battery program to, so that you can charge your battery at night when electricity's cheap? and use run off your battery during the day. Um, they're, they're creating uh, solar projects that are joint projects between a number of towns. Um, so that was exciting to us, that, you know, <coughs> that this is good for the short term, but really good for the long term. I, I think also the, the fact that we have these four options, the 33%, 50 and 100% green, it would be hard to do that with a broker because the buying power is much smaller. <laughs> right. Buying for a small group of uh, maybe 10,000 residents mm -hmm. instead of 100,000 residents where you can actually go and buy bigger chunks of right. the renewable power you want, uh, that's going to be very hard to do for a small town. Thank you. Towns? Go ahead. We have 30 communities, but who does find the suppliers? Obviously, it's not 30 people. Right. Well, how do you decide right. um, the coalition has uh, a risk management committee that works in conjunction with a company called Ascend Analytics that uh, is a national company that does energy buying. And Ascend um, sets up a portfolio for us of some short-term contracts, some long-term contracts to get the best uh, mix for mm. low and stable rates. And so, yes, we, we contract the buying out to us in, essentially. Brad has a question. Can you help me understand a little bit of the difference between some of these other companies like uh, Town Square and Direct Energy? We see rates that are you know, maybe lower than even the rate that we're talking yep. about. And mm -hmm. how do they play into all this? Well, you have to read the fine print on those uh, pretty, yeah. pretty carefully. <laughs> you can, they might give you a lower rate if you lock in for three years. Okay. Or they might, uh, or they might just genuinely give you a lower rate. Yeah. Uh, one thing with community power is that you can leave at any time. Yep. You just say, I want to go to something else and notify and it happens within 30 days or the next billing period um yeah. so uh you know it's confusing to look at all those other companies yeah. Yeah. um and that's one of the benefits we felt this offered was uh you get the the, the savings of a third party and some of the options of a third party yeah. but it's simple yeah <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of the a lot of people have, who previously went to get a third party supplier individually had concerns about how reliable is this company, what's the deal, am I going to yeah. be pulled into something um and um historically for the last 5 years or so businesses have switched to third party suppliers. I think 80% of all businesses in New Hampshire right now have a third party supplier, mm -hmm. not ever source, but they have energy managers who work for the company and this is what they do. Residents on the other hand, only about 20% of residents have signed up for a third party because they just don't trust yeah. the, the system, right? And when I've asked at the PUC about these companies on your website, I mean, how, how much vetting is done? Yeah. And nobody could give me a good answer. <laughs> so I think being in a coalition like this with a number of other towns and having a company of our own that vets the suppliers and makes sure we, we have genuine, reliable partners, uh, I think is even better than what's on the PUC website. Mm. Right. Thank you. 
Thank you both. Does anybody have any questions? Suzanne, do you have any questions for us? No. Steve? Uh, I just wanted to point out one other thing. Yes. Um, all those of you who live in Portsmouth have gotten this flyer, and it's like a four-page flyer. I believe the last mm -hmm. page on that flyer tells you also about the emissions that are generated when you use electricity. And if I'm mis not mistaken, the one that says um, Granite State Basic uh, tells you that for CO2, for uh, greenhouse gas, ga uh, gas of CO2, 648 pounds of emission is released per one megawatt hour of power. Um, most, the average usage uh, that's also listed at the flyer is like 600 watts uh, a month, kilowatts hours a month. That comes out to about seven, seven megawatts. So for 600 pounds times, se uh, times 12, you got 7,000, um, uh, something like 7,000 pounds of CO2 emission that you generate if you just have the basic Eversource 23% renewable. And then that when we go down to 100%, that pollution disappears to zero. And that's true for nitric oxides, which cause acid rain and smog. That's true for sulfur dioxide, which is also acid rain and health pollutants. All those emissions, you, every time you buy a little more greener energy, and you're not only saving some money in our plan, but you're also reducing the pollutants and emissions that happen from that uh, appropriate uh, energy. And that's why most people do it. They, they want green energy, but the green energy benefit is both healthy and uh, renewable, and in this case, even cheaper. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, Eversource doesn't give you that choice, mm. um, yeah. and which was another strong motivation for us to go, go this route. Um, and we actually sent a survey out to everybody in town, and we got 600 or so responses. And we found that <clears throat> um, a huge number of people would be willing to pay a little more for 100%, 20% of our city would be willing to pay more for 100% renewable. Well, right now, we can, you can be 100% green at, and still save money. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're hoping to get a lot of people signed up mm -hmm. to the renewable options. Okay. Some people Thank also you. ask, well, how can we do this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and why can't Eversource do it? <laughs> and the answer to that is, yes, they, they aggregate too. They buy big bulk power, and they're obligated under law to buy the lowest cost power they can get. And they only do this every six months. Mm -hmm. The Power Coalition, however, is not obligated to do that. We can buy energy every month during the six-month period, and we can buy it at different prices, and when we average out the price, the price can be and should be lower than what Eversource has because Eversource has to stick with that price for six months. And, Peter, that's because they have a contract to purchase every six months? The, the public utilities commission requires them. They're, they're a regulated, regulated. monopoly. Yeah. Okay. So by yeah. law, they're, reg they're regulated, and therefore they have to do that every six months, mm -hmm. and that's why they set new rates every six months. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they won't be able to force the coalition into that? No, because we're not regulated utility. I mean, right. we're not. Yeah. Okay. We don't have poles and wires. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for the presentation, John. We appreciate yeah. it. Well, we're excited. Thank you. Yeah. And for the work. Yes, for all the work, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to say thank you to Suzanne for joining us. Will you please let, the, let everyone know which committee you're from? Yeah, thank you for having me. I really kind of expected to come in and be around the edges, so I really appreciate your <laughs> yeah. warm welcome. Uh, there's a blue ribbon committee in the city to update the cultural plan. Okay. which dates back to 2002 and pretty much the entire point of it is what are the economic benefits of the arts to the city overall and I get enough there to have it all here but yeah. um, millions of dollars uh, flow back into the city because of our arts community 
um, AFTA is called the Americans for the Arts, and they last did a survey in 2017 here in Portsmouth and are currently doing another one. So the, the, the actual numbers, which I can get any information you, you desire um, mm -hmm. after so this. 43 million in 2000. Is it 43 million? Yeah. yeah. John knows. That goes back to the city. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and why I'm here is that I'm, I'm on the, um, uh, the committee that is in charge of communication. So we're, we've got a bare bones website. We're trying to populate with, with all kinds of information right now with the help of Monty has been wonderful. Yeah. Um, but y that's what we're interested in is getting the neighborhoods involved, okay. which is good. Okay. Well, this is a great start. Yeah. Thank you for joining us You're tonight. You're welcome. Yeah, I'll thank speak you. with you more later. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And does anybody else have any questions? Larry? Larry? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the transmission is breaking up, and so I'm, uh, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to sign off right now. I think the uh, community power idea is outstanding, and uh, I think uh, it's definitely worthwhile, and it's a, it's a huge public benefit. Uh, and I know that uh, both, um, 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 I know that a lot of people are working very hard here to to make this happen, and it's been very successful. I think it's a great program, and I I hope it really succeeds. Uh, the only Good other job. thing I want to mention before I leave is uh, the two suggestions from Jim's plane, one on the uh, neighborhood walk and the other on the time capsule, are really designed to bring neighborhoods together, mm -hmm. much like the um, parties and the uh, national night out and so forth. And so we really want to give that, those ideas some consideration and some discussion among all of us on the committee uh, to see how we can make use of them we, uh, if we have a drop off in forum uh, attendance, let's say, and we did have one um, the last time, and I remember a number of other times when we had um, a, that sort of thing happen, uh, it means that maybe our reach isn't quite there or, or we're missing some issues. I, I just don't know. But getting out and talking to the neighborhoods and uh, uh, directly as much as we can would probably make some difference. So I think the next meeting, uh, um, we, we should go ahead and see if we can get this on the agenda, at least for discussion as to what we want to do next. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for, for great presentations and and um, hope to see you uh, very, very soon. I'll be back in in um, uh, Islington Street in the next, uh, next two weeks. So okay, Larry. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks, thanks for joining us. Okay. Peter, what's next on the agenda? Um, it says uh, update on Spinnaker Point. Oh, yes. Did you want to just give a... Yeah, a sure. I can, I can mention that. Okay. And, and Larry's off now, but Larry and I uh, uh, went to the Recreation Board to speak to them about the, the condition at the Spinnaker Point Recreation Facility. <coughs> um, the recreation facility is not owned by the city, but is being leased by the city. And I think the lease has, uh, I believe, nine more years left on it, approximately. Um, and when we had the pandemic, uh, for a brief time, the, the place shut down, I think, for almost maybe a year, maybe less, I'm not sure. Uh, but prior to the pandemic, there were a number of issues at that facility that um, I and some other people had identified, and actually we came up with a list of 28 items. <laughs> some of them more serious than others, some of them are safety or maintenance issues, uh, and often we were told, well, this facility is not owned by the city, it's owned by the Spinnaker Point Association, so there's a little hesitancy in investing and doing things there, um, including the HVAC system and other things. For example, if, you, if you're a user of that facility, you'll know that there's an indoor track, which is fantastic. However, in the wintertime, it's so cold, people wear uh, winter, ma winter coats there. And in the summertime, it gets so hot that people are sweating. It's very humid on the track. There's no air conditioning or, or climate control. Uh, and uh, so that's one of the issues. And that's a big issue. 
Uh, but there's also a gym in the back. Uh, the original building was called a field house. In the back, there's a gym. And that gym is used now mainly for pickleball. And it's very popular. A lot of people are there. However, uh, it has issues, too. Uh, uh, pieces of the roof are, uh, roof panels are falling down on the, on the playing field regularly. Squirrels are falling down onto the playing field. Oh. <laughs> the water is leaking through the roof. Uh, the, the, there is also no air conditioning there. There is heating. Uh, but various maintenance issues are, are not being dealt with properly, we think. And um, so Larry and I, after the pandemic hit, uh, the city got a, huge, a large amount of money to fix things in that facility to make them more healthy, COVID uh, compliant and so <laughs> forth. And of that 28 list that we had compiled previously, I think only two were left on, on the list. Everything else was fixed. I mean, from black flies in the shower stalls to <laughs> all kinds of mold everywhere, uh, all that stuff was fixed and it was great. However, two things were not fixed. The, the track, the air conditioning and cooling and heating on the track, as well as uh, the fact that the one of the locker rooms has very poor ventilation, always did and still does. But the, the gym area, that was never addressed at all during that period. So what Larry and what Larry and I did uh, together is we, we put in a two requests for a capital improvements pro project. One of them was to fix the remaining issues at that facility that had not been fixed yet. And the second was to ask the city to consider outright purchase of that building so it would be their building. And so they could make changes and improvements uh, that are needed. And incidentally, the utilities, the gas utility and the electric utility, all of them would pay us up to 50% uh, when we upgrade to a better quality system of heating and cooling uh, based on the New Hampshire Saves program. So we could, we could get a lot of rebate money from those utilities if we were to do this. Uh, we put in these two CIPs. Uh, one CIP for the remaining issues came back from the city's staff saying, you need to go to the, uh, the rec board and talk to them about this because we don't own the building. And the other one, with outright purchasing, they were saying this is a city council decision. If they want to buy it, they need to make that decision. We cannot do it through this process. And so therefore, uh, you need to talk to them about it. Uh, however, they pointed out, again, we don't own this building. We only do what's absolutely necessary. So the maintenance and everything, we're obligated under the lease to do that. But the problem is, since we don't own it, we're not making any real investments long term to keep it. And right now, it is the premier uh, facility for, for seniors. It has a swimming pool and an indoor track, and uh, it's worth keeping. It's, it's a great facility, and uh, so we made that proposal. So Larry and I went to the rec board saying, okay, we were told to come to you with these issues. So last month, he and I went there, and we talked about the issues that we felt were still in need of attention, and that this facility is greatly appreciated by so many people in this town especially with seniors. When you think about the winter months when people can't go out walking anymore, they go to the fitness center and they walk on the track instead of walking outdoors on icy sidewalks. So it's really important to them. So we made that presentation and uh, we gave them a list of what we, we did so far and the items that needed attention. So we're hoping that some attention will be given to it in the next couple months. Okay. So we just wanted to update the, because okay. our committee had previously passed a resolution that we sent to the city council about the fact that we wanted to have those repairs done in the okay that's okay. so hopefully in a couple of months we hope that there will the, be some response okay, to that yeah great yeah. thank you for the update yeah and next i believe is about the grand, the grand parade. parade so you want to do that maybe yes okay. well you got the sign already i right? sent <laughs> i sent um a few emails, a couple of emails to the committee, mm -hmm. and um, I just did this quick <laughs> drawing on Canva of what our banner could look like for the for the parade. 
So, so the idea is we would have a banner identifying the citywide neighborhood committee that would be part of the grand parade. Yes. And we would invite all the neighborhoods to participate <coughs> with yes. us. And I've, I've been reaching out to neighborhood reps and individual residents as well. And I encourage everyone here to kind of get the word out as well. Um, because sometimes even though there's a neighborhood rep for a neighborhood, the message doesn't necessarily get through to the to the other residents. So I've been digging through my emails from my NNO and also looking on my Facebook, see who's my, you know, who my friends are that are in Portsmouth that I can reach out to. So if you guys can get the word out, we would love for all residents whose neighborhoods don't get to organize to march with us. I know of one neighborhood that's that's registered and they're ready to go. A couple of neighborhoods were kind of thinking about it, but they have yet to organize. But they're, um, the people I've spoken with know that, that we are going to be marching and they're welcome to join us. So um, one of the ideas that we talked about in, in brainstorming and even when Peter and I first met with Valerie of the Portsmouth 400, Valerie was just here, Valerie had suggested that when we have people march in the parade for neighborhoods, you can, depending on what the neighborhoods do, okay? For example, if people are gonna march with us, they can just put which neighborhood they're from, and it could be Ocean Road, which is where we're from, it could be Maple Haven, it could be Spinnaker, it could be Fosse. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I did was I did Ocean Road for my neighborhood, and then I put my flag, the island that I'm from. I'm from the island of Saipan, which is a US territory. And this is our flag. Mm. So, and you can also put the US flag if you want, because I am a US citizen. So I can pass that around for you guys to look and at. And if somebody wants, and we, we also th suggested that if somebody wants to have like a, an ethnic flag of the their original family heritage. Yes, you can. You know, do that's that as also well. a way of showing the diversity in in Portsmouth of various mm -hmm. communities. I'm sure, like the North End and and the South End had yeah. different backgrounds. Maybe so. Whatever people feel comfortable with identifying in the parade, whether it's the neighborhood or an ethnicity or something, they're welcome to march behind our banner. Yes. So we came up with a couple of designs for a banner. Uh, yes, that, that you just gave, around. handed around, yes. and uh, um, we 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 also got a quote for having for to make a banner. So we're we're going to probably go ahead as soon as we get a decision here today on which design we like to go ahead with that banner. So so I think the first thing we wanted to do is get some input on what people think yes. of these designs that we have. I did receive a response from. Kathleen and from Will, they both liked sample one, which is the one I printed. With Portsmouth which, at the it's top. Portsmouth at the top. Yeah. The other, the other sheet. So the other sheet. And um, the and again, that's just a mock-up. We can change yeah. the font. Yeah. We can change. Change the colors. We can change. Yes, we can add color to the to the yeah. banner if we want, or it could just be a white banner. Mm -hmm. But pretty much, we'll have the, that that text, that context, mm -hmm. the um, Portsmouth City White Neighborhood Committee. And then we'll have our logo, just our in our email and Facebook, Facebook page, and then of course the Portsmouth, um, the city of Portsmouth symbol. Um, symbol. Seal, yeah. Seal. So, um, if you guys, if the committee members, if John just approves of that, if, if a design that kind of looks like that, yeah, that's I was just what we'll about use. Because I wondered about whether you know, it'd be more sim more simple. Just do you really want to have a 12 foot long thing, or do you just want to have a six foot that you might be able to use somewhere else you know might be more adaptable to have a six foot by two and a half foot sign or something i don't know rather than a 12 foot sign i think the okay. did, didn't didn't the uh, police department say that the national night out banners they have they are smaller or yes small. it was maybe smaller yeah, yeah. Just maybe it was oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe they're six so feet. so we're Probably. thinking if we're in this parade six. you don't want to have too small a sign because basically no. we're leading this group and we'll have a pole on it so two people can, can, can hold stand the on it. Yes, the and then side. the rest of us can march in the back. And of course, we'll invite our spouses and our kids, grandkids, yeah. whoever wants to march and with it, us. It, and you can take the pole out and just tie it up somewhere, if too. You put so. in it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So it has that capability. Mm -hmm. 
So, so your, is it your table? So something like your table would be six feet, right? That middle right. table. Yes, that's six. Exactly. Feet. So that's mm -hmm. what I thought. Something that that's probably six by two and a half. So yeah. that would be the size of that banner. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I think a 12 foot, foot would be the size of, of both correct. of those tables. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I think a 12 foot would be would yeah. be good. It won't be reusable in other ways, like right. you're mentioning. It won't be as versatile. Which right. may not be a problem, but mm -hmm. you know. And it might be unruly if you think of, you know, depending upon weather or whatever that is. You know, 12 yeah. foot banner okay. might be unruly. Yeah. I'm yeah. not excluding so, just to say. So you're saying you might be concerned that 12 foot's too long. That was my consideration. Yeah. It might, okay. Six might be more appropriate for so many reasons. I mean, we could reasons. make it 10, 10 if we think yes, that's a whatever. better size. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was just a random number we picked. Okay. okay, so right now it's 12 by 3, but we could consider 10 by 3. Yeah, yeah, okay. sure. We'll, Peter will run it by Alpha Graphics, mm -hmm. and, we'll, we'll, and we'll share the, you know, we'll share the uh, information you. might get it with, with the you. pocket for a, for a, a for pole the pole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's, yeah. that's what we have. Well, yeah. so yes, it's be, both. So it could be tied. Right? It would be both, yeah. Mm -hmm. And with that said. Um, yeah. So, so I guess, um, so I, I, I got a quote uh, from Alpha Graphics, which the police department also uses occasionally. Yes, they did. Um, and the quote was for $393. Uh, and um, we, we as a committee don't have a dime to spend. <laughs> we <laughs> uh, don't, but, yes. That's but Elaine and I decided, uh, and John also agreed, that we would be willing to make, we'll to donate make to this effort. Yeah. If any of you would like to donate anything towards the effort, you can do that. I have volunteered to, 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 to go to the place and get the thing made and have, pay for it initially myself and then get reimbursed from the other people okay. who are donating towards it. Anybody wants so, to make um, a donation? So that part of it will take care of, but we should decide if we want like different color, the, the printing, yeah. or, or did you just want white and, white and black, or maybe white and like dark red or something, maroon or something, you know, whatever we think is a good looking banner. Mm -hmm. Well, I like I like um, simple. I like the if we do a color background, maybe like a blue background with white letters, hmm. or it could be black letters or blue letters on a black on a white background. What do you guys What do you guys think for for colors? See? Yeah, to, I'm a visual yeah. person. I know. I yeah, yeah. See yeah, mine is just about uh, it. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to have. I mean, it sounds color big. background. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, to be honest, it sounds big, and yeah. is, is it? How many people need to carry? Oh, just a two. A 12, 10 just, footer. Oh, just two. two. Well, if we have a pole, We're gonna one have on a pole. either side is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you know what the material? I haven't seen the material. Twelve foot banner by three with a wooden dowel. That's twelve feet long. You'll want you to one person is not likely going to be comfortable carrying that. So you just change some people around oh, yeah, we'll yeah, 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 we, yeah, we yeah. We could do that, so yeah, it, uh, yeah. doesn't seem like much when you just stand there, but if you're trying to walk from <laughs> Hannaford to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> someone's, no, anyone get will get tired, yeah. You know, I'm, I, 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 I'm John, almost partial to the idea of having a white background just because it's brighter and it's, you know, it's more light reflection, but having the lettering in a different color maybe than just black, it could be a dark color, but it doesn't necessarily have to be just black. Okay. I mean, so I don't you have know. A background. What anybody um, have preference for this? I think you could you could have alpha graphics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you uh, go. Give, you give us come up samples, some yeah. options. Yeah. You know, maybe yeah. maroon on yellow or something. It's a like click that. of a mouse kind maroon of. Maroon on yellow. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. You might consider. Um, you might consider, uh, not to open a bigger can of worms, but the CNC is a brand. And do you want to create some brand continuity if you're going to spend 300 and something dollars on something? So mm. this may become, you know, if you want people to recognize it, you're going to want the same colors to exist across from this year to next year to the area and, and even on the website, wherever that is. Otherwise, they're going to be like, you know, there'll be confusion yeah. there. So just this is out. our logo. This is our logo. Yep. It's black and white. Uh -huh. But I see what you're saying. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll have Alpha Graphics come up with some color combinations and then the committee will take a look at those colors yeah. and I'll send you an email and well yeah I think we got to do that pretty quickly because we, we don't have a lot of time so it's almost like um, uh, maybe one or two of us could yeah, go into the alpha graphics I could tell them ahead of time we'd like to look at a couple okay. comparisons uh, and they could set something up uh, sure, yeah. to give us the, what it looks like visually 
Mm -hmm. uh, it, one thing, if we have a color background, then the seal of the city might look different, you know, because that yeah, has they, yellow they in can, it, for example. And they can maybe place it into like a white box. Yeah, that's a possibility too. So, oh. so if everyone's comfortable with that, or okay. if someone wants to join us, and it's saying women are better at color than men. <laughs> And uh, I, this, is, this is objectively the case. I worked for Sylvania Lighting for 30 years, mm -hmm. and the standard for determining when light, uh, when light bulbs were looking like good rendition of color was initially, way back in the 19th century, there was a group of like 10 women in Paris who were the, the standard. <laughs> Oh, you have to go to them, you show the product, they said, okay, this is a 90% rating, this is a 100% rating. That's how they rated color, color renditioning, how well colors are, are repeated with different lighting problems. So, so if somebody <laughs> one, uh, thinks they're good at color issues, then that's the kind of person we need for this, <laughs> this task. Okay. Well, I'll definitely join you. Anybody I mean, else want to join us? And when would you go? Well, we could set that up anytime. Yeah. You know. Well, but you only have a week, right? So yeah. 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 Tomorrow. Well, or yeah. Tomorrow or, or. Let's do tomorrow. Let's try to for yeah. tomorrow. Tomorrow. A anytime you're available tomorrow. Oh. All right. That's what I'm just trying to figure is my schedule for tomorrow. Okay. Probably okay. afternoon. Just okay. afternoon. afternoon too. Yeah. Afternoon. That's for me. I think it's the same way. Afternoon. Double check my schedule. Okay. I'm looking at Friday. I will call them in the morning mm -hmm. and ask them if it's okay for us to come over in the afternoon and look okay. at that. Okay. And then we'll I'll get back to you and say when when it would be a good time. Okay. And actually, early afternoon would be really good for me. Sometime just noon or just after, if that's fine. And if not, okay. I'm just okay. 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 Kathleen. Okay. Yeah. Well, but but of the of the three or the three designs, that's the one most people prefer. The one that starts with Portsmouth, right? Yes. Okay. Because the other one doesn't have Portsmouth at the very top. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I think there's one more thing or on the agenda. Uh, next forum date says oh, okay. here on the agenda. So the next okay. forum day, we're going to work on it, but it's five months away. So it's we're okay. going to work it on to its. Um, like Five either months. the end of September to the beginning October. of October. Okay, okay, so September, October, something like that's that. That's when right? it's going to be. That's okay. when we we're talking. And which about form? Which ward it's is that? Be Ward Five, I believe it is. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. People okay. will get a neighborhood the walk-in before then. Hmm? The big one. The, the big one. The big one. Yeah, that's <laughs> you guys. You're five. You're five. Yeah. Five. yeah. Okay. I just want to say it's an election year, so we want to watch our dates. So. Yes, we'll look Fossey at that. has right. a forum, its own yes. candidates forum and things. So right, okay. right. Um, Do you know the dates? The week. September is September's not just one or two forums, but October's every week. Okay. So, every, so these guys are really busy, So, you so. know, it might almost be better to do it like in early November, right after the election, so we don't conflict with these other things. I don't know. I mean, we can think yeah. about it. We can it. talk about it. Yeah, so let me, you know, we can yeah. talk about with... Um, with the Jessica and, and the uh, okay. right. Joanne. Yeah, yeah. See okay. what they really have to okay. say. They're, they're, they're pretty strong about okay. it should have been in the end of September, beginning of October, and we don't want to burden all the people that were coming because we're getting, we're jamming it up and we're getting to Yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. so we'll get the rhythm okay. that works a little better right. for the city. <laughs> all right. But maybe that works, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, then. I think that's all, and so I could entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank everybody. You. Thank you for great joining us. These guys. <laughs> a lot of good information. I'm thankful you were hard work on that. It's so good. Uh, what are we, seven? Oh, seven. Next meeting Recording is. Stopped. Thanks a lot, Frank. Thank you. Our next, our next okay. formal meeting.